swap over and say hello to Dwango AC and Soren. There's Tazbot looking super duper cute, of course. Uh, very excited to have you both on. Feel free to do a countdown and then we can get started. All right. In three, two, one, go. I think we should just give a little bit of a high level overview of what Triforce Percent is for those of you who have not seen the GDQ run. Um, it is up on Dwango AC's channel, uh, the Taskbot channel, and also on the GDQ channel. You can see it either place. Um, basically, when we will go, we will explain more in detail, very much detail, what arbitrary code execution is. But basically, it is a set of exploits that allows the player of a game to take control of the game, take control of the console, and make whatever they want, whatever they can develop and program and inject happen within the game. And it's very important. We're not modifying the ROM in advance. We didn't modify the cartridge. The console is unmodified other than an RGB mod, which we use to get a clean video signal, but that doesn't affect any of the gameplay. So it's really, you're sitting down with the vanilla game, the console, you press buttons really fast, or rather Taskbot presses buttons really fast, and things start changing in the game. And so we did this at GDQ. Uh, we did this under the guise of beta showcase. And it's not entirely false. We were showing a bunch of beta content, some content that was left on the cartridge, you know, left on the cutting room floor, other content which Nintendo had actually made way back in the day, but wasn't left on the cartridge, and we, our team recreated it. And then there's some content that we completely made up in order to string things together and make a nice plot. But basically, we started the game, we did this ace exploit, Taskbot took over, dumped a bunch of data into the console's memory, and then the, the contents of the game started being different. And it was basically an alternate plot, a new, you know, a new quest that we went on for about an hour, culminating in getting the Triforce. It, we, we showed some beta content, but we also put the beta content together into a coherent story, you know, basically a, you know, a, a made up fan story. Um, that then, you know, led to people, these urban legends coming true and people's dreams about the game being realized. Yeah, that's... Any overall points I missed there, Durango? That is a good summary. Okay, so there's one thing to talk about, which is what exactly is this arbitrary uh, uh, ACE, arbitrary uh, code execution in the context of what we did. Now, ACE is actually a category you'll see, and even on the Nintendo 64 Ocarina of Time leaderboards, you'll see any percent includes stale reference manipulation ACE. Now, we're going to get into more of what those words mean in a second, but the biggest aspect of this is arbitrary code execution means exactly what you think it means. It means arbitrary. It means you can do anything. And most of the time, in the speedrunning contexts, that means jumping to the end credits as fast as possible, or getting to a condition that the community agrees for that game is the win condition. Now, a lot of what we're going to show you is going to apply to the N64 OOT any percent ace category. In other words, what you're about to see isn't necessarily specific to us for the most part. It will diverge a little bit at the end, and we'll cover that point a little bit. But uh, don't assume that what we're telling you is just Taskbot. This is largely at the beginning going to be something that a human runner can and will do. And actually, it might be a good time really quick to pause and talk about save states role and what they had to do uh, as at a high level. Do you want to tackle that, Soren? Well, I also have a quick question, sure, if that's okay. Sure. Um, I, yeah. I was seeing a few people in chat mentioning things about like wondering if there's any kind of like version restrictions on the cartridge for this like specific showcase. Yeah. So um, the version that we compiled um, will work on 1.0 American version only. Okay. Um, we can make a couple of changes to the patches that we used for the text system because we patched, you know, we did custom text, we did a lot of patches throughout. Mm -hmm. And if we wanted that to support Japanese text and patching Japanese text, we would have had to make a minor change there. Then it could have worked with 1.0 Japanese. Okay. If we had rebuilt everything with different addresses in the code, it might, if you're not a programmer, this might not make a lot of sense, but basically, you basically change a database that has all of locations of where everything is in memory. If we change that out, this could work on any N64 version of Ocarina of Time. But these strategies do not work on the GameCube versions, virtual console versions, or anything like that because of the way that they're, th those are all emulated and the way that those emulators work. Um, basically, they just, they, they won't work with the way that we're doing arbitrary code. Sure. Okay, awesome. Thanks. 
Safe State is a human speedrunner. They are a current world record holder in one of the categories of Ocarina of Time speedrunning. I don't remember which one it is. Um, and their former world record in several other categories. So, um, you know, normally you see a speedrun, uh, it's either an RTA speedrun by a human. Real RTA is real time attack. Uh, you know, a speed, normal speedrun being played by a normal human. Um, or it's a TAS. So it's either a task being played on the computer or being played on the real console by TaskBot. Uh, but for Triforce Percent, we need both <laughs> a human speedrunner and TaskBot. Um, the first however many minutes of this explanation video that you see of doing the A setup has to be done by a human. It cannot be done by, a ta by TaskBot. Trust us, we tried. Um, and the reason is that, yeah, we tried. Um, <laughs> the reason is that uh, Ocarina of Time has a couple of different things about how it works, and I won't get into too much technical detail, but um, basically the timing of lag frames is random and can be potentially de dependent on the RNG. And the RNG is dependent on the CPU cycle counter. And so if you want to do a task on an emulator, you need it to be cycle accurate. Um, because otherwise the, the cycle counter will be different, then the RNG will be different, and then what happens in the game will be different. And that also means that the timing of the lag frames will be different. And on top of just having the CPU emulation be cycle accurate, the CPU has to wait for the basically the GPU, the RSP and RDP in the in the N64 to finish doing operations. And it waits for that. And so the amount of time it waits depends on how long that takes to operate. So you have to have a cycle accurate emulator for the graphics. And that the long the, the amount of time it takes to do that depends on how long the memory takes to respond to transactions. So you actually have to have a cycle emula accurate emulator of the entire system in order to have any chance at this. And that does not exist yet. There are some the emulators that are in development that are sort of getting there, but it doesn't exist yet. And even if you have all of that, inside the console, there's actually two different clock chips. Um, they're, they're actually separate quartz crystals. And those two clocks can drift relative to each other. And normally they probably don't drift by very much. And we're not sure if over, you know, 10 or 15 minute speed run, if they would drift enough to make a problem for, for desyncs. But theoretically they will drift. And so theoretically that is an effect that you cannot model with an emulator because the amount that they drift depends on the local heating inside the console and everything. So basically for timing reasons, you make a task, you play it back on the console, it will do a different thing every time. And that's, you know, task, we need it to be the, exactly the same thing every time. So we tried, can't do it. So we need a human to actually be playing, actually watching what's happening on screen and responding to it. So that's why we got safe state to, uh, you know, do the whole yeah, stuff. We needed them. And by the way, this isn't a problem that's unique to the Nintendo 64. I have here, um, they very, very yellowed. Super Nintendo. Uh, the Super Nintendo has the same problem. It has a main CPU clock that runs at 21 megahertz and a audio processing unit, an APU, that runs at 24.576 megahertz. The former, the CPU uh, clock, is a proper quartz crystal. The APU, the audio portion, is a ceramic oscillator. It changes over time, it changes over temperature. And the specification that was given to the developer that said, hey, it runs at 24.576, isn't actually how the hardware works, especially 20 plus, almost 30 years on uh, for the Super Nintendo's case. So even if you had everything right, you might still be dealing with components that are not matching what the original software developer was told about how the system would perform, how, how fast it would be. Um, but yeah, it, in the case of specifically Ocarina of Time, we did a lot of testing, and it's the simple things like the uh, Kokiri Forest has those little moats that are floating around. Well, each one of those is random, and it introduces different behavior. So we cannot get deterministic uh, results out of, uh, out of replay devices or TaskBot. Um, I need to touch on that really quickly, and then we'll move on to the actual explanation that we intended to get to. TaskBot is pretty much a player piano. If you've ever seen a player piano with a piano roll, it's nothing more and nothing less than a pre-composed song that's played back as a sequence of notes in order. And a tool-assisted speedrun is the same thing. Just like how a musician would compose a song in advance and then play it back after the fact, we're doing the same thing with a tool-assisted speedrun. We're making the run in an emulator. In most cases, this particular run we're about to describe to you, Ocarina of Time, uh, Ace Showcase, or Beta Showcase as we called it, 
is a little different, but most of the time, a tool-assisted speedrun is made in an emulator in advance. You can think of it just like composing a song. And after the fact, we take the full, what we call a movie file, and instead of playing back a series of notes on a player piano, we're playing back a sequence of button presses on a console. So normally, when we're doing tool-assisted speedruns with TaskBot on, say, the Super Nintendo, we'll connect TaskBot to a replay device, he has this one here. Yes, I have to hand it to him. This is Onosaurus's, um, let me get this the right orientation. This is Onosaurus's uh, Task TM32. This is an older revision. Uh, this is what we put in Taskbot's hands when he is connected to a real video game, video game console. It pretends to be a controller. You power on the console. It sends a sequence of button presses and beats the game. So Task Tool Assisted Speedrun is a process made in an emulator Console verification, what we do with TaskBot with a replay device, is a completely separate process that you can think of as a performance of that art, as it were. It's like a transformative art. So I said a whole lot of stuff. I'm fairly certain Soren probably has a couple of comments as well. <laughs> and maybe even Fu has some comments. Yeah, I, no, I, w I was just going to say that, um, you know, while, while most tasks are made in an emulator by somebody sort of single stepping and entering, the inputs that they want on every single frame, looking at memory, going back in time, redoing things, that kind of process. Uh, Triforce Percent was not made like that at all. All of the inputs that TaskBot is making were written, were, were created, were you know composed, to use the musical metaphor, by scripts which myself and the rest of the team wrote. So we were, you know, wrote programs to generate you know, to basically turn the, the custom data and stuff we wanted to do into controller input that then get fed into TaskBot and, you know, connect to the game and do things in the game. So let's get into this video. Yeah. Okay, so what we're going to get started on now is talking about how Save State was able to do what they did. And this will also apply, this next section will also apply to the any percent of the OOT in 64 speedruns that you'll see. So I'm going to jump way ahead here. Doot, 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 doot. We're going to go through... Now, this is the actual raw video from Retro Game Mechanics Explains channel. So you'll see references to video, and that's totally fine here in the lower right corner. Um, what I'm going to talk about, though, is what it takes to effectively interpret all these buttons as code. And first, we've got to talk about how the controller works. This is, this is kind of crazy stuff. So first of all... Um, the, the button presses for the controllers are stored at memory address 8011D790. There's one byte for A, B, Z, S, up, down, left, right. One byte, uh, one byte for um, L, R, up, down, left, right. And then X and Y each take a byte. There's a byte for error codes, things like the controller not plugged in, and another byte uh, for padding. And altogether, this makes up a total of 24 bytes. So by pressing buttons and moving around the control stick on the controllers, the values in these memory addresses change. Now, under normal circumstances, the game's code can read these values and know what the player is currently pressing and update those, uh, update that in the game normally. But the area of memory that this is stored in is just like any other area of memory. You can execute code, you can store data, it doesn't matter. The Nintendo 64 is definitely not memory safe. Uh, anything you want to add to that section before we move on? Okay. Nope. That's, that's, you know, a modern system uh, has protection so that the same region of memory you can't write in, directly write data to and then also execute. But the N64 is actually kind of modern in some ways, but in this, ma in this matter, it's not set up that way. All of the memory can be written or executed. And so that's exactly what we're going to be doing. Yeah. And as you can see here, the memory address for the controllers can be treated as as code, but it will greatly depend on what buttons and angle of the controller sticks are held uh, to define what happens. And most of the time it might be completely garbage data. But you can, if you hit the buttons in just the right order, you can, you can do valid instructions here. It is possible. So obviously the game developers never intended you to be executing code. So I'm going to uh, pause here for a second. Um, they never expected you to be running code from the controller point uh, ports. This was never anything that they uh, they planned on happening, and uh, it, it gets it gets kind of weird. Um, let me actually bump just ahead to a jump bit. in here. So um, you know, interpreting 
there's two steps to any arbitrary code execution exploit. There is setting up the code you want to run to be in memory somewhere, and then there is getting the game to then execute that code. So when we're talking about pressing buttons in the controller and having the memory, you know, manipulating what's in that memory, that's changing the memory that's holding the state of the controllers to being whatever we want it to be based on, or it's, it's not entirely whatever we want, there's some restrictions on it, but you know, for the most part, you can press buttons however you want, you can have that memory be whatever you want. That by itself doesn't get arbitrary code execution. Most of the setup is actually to actually try to get to get the game to actually jump execution to that memory that is the controllers. That's the hard part. <laughs> well, yeah. in, in, in each game, each of those two halves may or may be the hard part. Um, but in this case, that's the hard part. Yeah. Now we're going to get to a, a conversation on what stale reference manipulation is. And, and stale reference manipulation is the term used inside of the community, but a better word for it from a more of a, say, security perspective is a use after free exploit is really what this is. So uh, we'll, we'll refer to it as stale reference manipulation to, or SRM for short, to keep with the nom nomenclature that you, you will see used in the ACE I'm sorry, in the uh, Ocarina of Time in 64, any percent runs that use SRM glitches, uh, but it is a use after free exploit. So we need to talk a little bit about the heap. So there's, there's some fun things about the heap. Um, so first of all, a heap is basically an area of dynamically allocated memory where data blocks of different sizes are reserved for use uh, by various objects and functions. And in Ocarina of Time, there's a very specific heap called the actor heap, which contains all the data for the actors that are currently loaded in the game. Uh, that can be pretty much anything, whether it's Link himself, rupees, or even some hidden objects. And there so are... Are actors kind of like just any, any item, object, or character? Pretty much. An actor is anything in the scene that has a behavior. Okay, so, great. like, okay. a wall is not an actor, but a bush that you can cut or, you know, a rupee that you can collect is an actor. And just to, exactly. just to uh, uh, add to what Duango said, um, the actor heap, importantly, doesn't just store the data for the actors, it also stores the code for the actors. That's cool. exactly how we're going to be doing all of this. When you go through loading zone, um, it will load the code and the data, and the data is, you know, holding the current state of the actor. Let's say it's, you know, variables saying where it is, what it's doing. Um, and then the code is, you know, fixed normally until we come along. It's, it's completely fixed, never changes. And those are both on the actor heap. And so when we go through a loading zone or when we, when we, um, you know, let's say we collect that rupee, it will disappear from the actor heap, or at least its data allocation will. Um, when we go through a loading zone that isn't changing to a new scene, but just a new room within the same scene, the new actors will load in the new in, into the actor heap, um, starting from where the old actors were. So it'll load the new actors, and then it'll get rid of the old actors. And so every time you go back and forth across the loading zone, it'll reshuffle where things are in memory. So and by you know picking things up, that'll also remove things from the heap, which will also shuffle later where things were later in memory. So the first set of actions that we're doing. Um, through through the the setup is seem like randomly collecting rupees and things, but that's actually manipulating the actor heap so that we can get a particular alignment between where one item was at one time and then where another item is going to load in. So if that sounds a little overwhelming, don't worry. We have pictures to make it even more overwhelming. Uh, I don't mean that literally. Uh, we'll try to make this make a little bit more sense with some. Uh, some animations. Again, huge credit to Isofreeze. Their animation or his animation capabilities are astoundingly good. So you'll see that here in a second. Uh, by the way, the animations you're about to see uh, in a little bit are the actual data from the heap. He had a tool to extract it from memory and uh, interpret it in his animation software. It was really kind of cool. So there's some behind the scenes stuff for you. Okay. So let's talk about this actor heap. There's something interesting about what's going on here. You have both actors and actor overlays because you, you, you don't want to necessarily have to duplicate the behavior of certain actors. So uh, there will be the actors themselves and they'll have an individual instance, but you'll have an actor overlay that will have metadata about or have data about all of the actors of that type. So Rupee, have, have the overlay, overlay is the code. 
yeah, the overlays of code, and then there's individual instances effectively. Is that a good way to phrase it? Yeah, yeah. So the reason it's called an overlay is because where that code gets allocated into memory is not at a fixed location. It gets overlaid basically into the heap. And when the game loads it, it actually has to fix all the addresses in the code in order to actually allow it to work. But yes, you have one instance of an overlay for a particular object and then multiple instances of the, the actual data for holding the state of those different instances of the actor. Yeah. Now, this is going to get kind of interesting because when you leave an area and come back, they have to be reallocated. So you'll end up in a situation where they move around. Um, so if you need to load a new object, it will search for a free area of memory from the beginning of the heap and then drop it wherever it happens to find a free spot and repeat over and over again, starting from the beginning up at 801DAA00 all the way to the bottom uh, there. And actors and overlays are just randomly assigned in memory wherever. So if you leave an area, some actors are going well, to Well, they're not cold. random. That's the important part is they're well, deterministic. Not, well, they aren't random. They are yeah. not random. They are, in fact, deterministic. But <laughs> um, they, are, uh, they are deterministic in the sense that player input, if it's always consistent, will always result in the same outcome. Uh, right. But you cannot guarantee from the outside where they will be unless you fully control the system in that way. Is that right. a better way of phrasing it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Normally they would be random. We make them not random. That's part of the joy of it. And so, if you're, if, you know, if you're watching this and you're wondering, well, how did anybody figure any of this out in the first place? Two answers. One, this was found in 2019. The game came out in 1998. That was 21 years. So people were working on this for 21 years before they found this exploit. And then the second thing is that um, people use emulators and people will also use GZ, which is a mod for Ocarina of Time that gives you memory editor, save states, all kinds of speed running and, you know, tech tools. So you can actually do your actions and then look at the heap and see what, what it looks like, see where everything is, do more actions, make sure you did it right. We didn't use that during the live performance. Of course, it was on a real, you know, original cartridge, but you can practice and save state did practice very much with GZ with, you know, a bunch of memory watches and stuff just to make sure everything was, that, that they were learning it right. So then they can go on the, you know, without the crutches and, and do it right. Yeah. Oh, man, there's, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. As Soren pointed out, this is years of effort that went into getting to this point. And every time we kind of started going backward to see who we needed to give credit to for all of this, we couldn't really figure out a place to stop. <laughs> like, we just kept going back in history farther and farther, and there was always more people to credit. So <laughs> the next part to talk about is, all right, we've, we've left an area. Now we're going to come back in. And this results in actors and overlays being assigned new memory areas, uh, or new memory locations that might not be where they were before. And if you can somehow get it to point to the to, to where an old actor was, for instance, you can end up with a stale reference. Uh, that's kind of a, a lame way of phrasing it. I'll try to explain this better. Um, yeah, the, so the stale instance, reference doesn't the stale reference doesn't come about as a result of the shuffling. The shuffling we need to do the shuffling so that when we have the stale reference, what the staleness, what it points to, is the right thing. Um, but that doesn't itself get us the stale reference. So that, that is another part of the setup is to get the stale reference. Yeah, and one of the things here that you'll see is some actors, kind of like this boomerang, need to have a, a pointer or a reference to another actor and their data. So a good example of this is that the boomerang, the boomerang actor keeps a reference to, say, the rupee. The rupee is just an actor, but it's keeping a reference to that rupee that it's grabbed. And under normal circumstances, if an actor references another actor, uh, like this rupee here, the second actor shouldn't unload or be freed from the heap before the first actor either unreferences it or it unloads itself. If you don't do that, you end up with a stale reference. So in other words, the pointer that this actor is now pointing to is a memory location that's not being used anymore. Let me get bumped up here a little bit. So. That's no longer in use. It's now a stale reference. So in the boomerang case, the boomerang has grabbed the rupee, flying back towards Link. If we somehow get the rupee to unload at that time, the, ru the boomerang doesn't know that. The boomerang is still writing to that pointer, and at that address, it's writing in the updated position. If we get a chest to load in that same position, all of a sudden the chest will come hurtling back on the boomerang to us. 
because the boomerang's code is just overwriting whatever is at the other end of that pointer, which happens to be now the chest's position. So we talked about that uh, that that chest example where you can grab a a rupee, but then make it grab a uh, grab something completely different, like a, uh, a completely, you know just a totally different object. So all right, let's talk about this this uh, rupee here. So if a boomerang were to grab a rupee, it would specifically work with offsets two four two eight and two c within the allocated memory of the heap. You'll see that animated here on the screen here. And each one of those is the X, Y, and Z coordinates of the actor it's holding. But if you have a stale reference that's now pointing to an actor overlay instead of a normal actor, what you're ending up changing is blocks of code, right? You're, you're literally just writing 32-bit uh, float data into places where 32-bit MIPS assembly instructions are supposed to be held. So if you manage to get the code for this overlay to execute uh, after the boomerang modifies it, it will likely just crash because in most cases, it's probably not going to be sane code. So let, let's kind of walk over that a little bit. Um, if you can control exactly what values are being written by the actor and exactly what instructions, uh, you could modify the code that the game executes. So. At that point, you can execute arbitrary code. That's, that's what, what we're trying to do here is, is ultimately we're trying to execute arbitrary code. And in and at this eighth, point, just by yeah. the way, that, at this point, that arbitrary code would be three instructions for what the yes. example that's on screen. And probably those are going to crash. So there is a big difference between running one or two arbitrary instructions that the user wrote and then taking total control of the game and you know, injecting cut, custom cutscenes where Link gets the Triforce. So, um, you know, just to, just to give the idea that arbitrary code execution means even just executing one single instruction written by the player. Um, but then, of course, we're going to use that. We get one little foothold in, we use that to take over the whole game, um, which is another, you know, fun part of, of the whole process. All right, so... What I'm going to do now is have Soren talk over this portion. Uh, he's going to do a better job of explaining what Save State did. This is a video of of the beginning portion that we would normally have a human do. You know, we talked about the heat manipulation. By the time that you're seeing this video, the heat manipulation was already done. Link has just picked up a rock. The Link has a pointer to the rock. Link is walking way off screen through a loading zone. When he goes through the loading zone, the rock unloads. And then when he goes back through the loading zone, the code for another actor will go will load into that same location in memory, um, and I should just mention that it's because of a bunch of glitches that allowed uh, Save State to lock the camera that we were able to have the lock the rock unload when Link goes through the loading zone off screen. Um, that that's not a normal thing. You can carry objects through loading zones. It's because of other glitches. So, you know, how many glitches were here? Well, there's multiple glitches that are used to lock the camera. Then there's the heat manipulation, which is not itself a glitch. Then there is the use after free, which is a by itself, well, it's a bug, but it's a bug that would never be encountered in normal gameplay because Link never can get that far off away from the camera, but because of the glitches which lock the camera, then you can do that. So, you know, what, what parts of this are glitches? Well, it's, you know, there are glitches that you use to get this, but it's not quite as straightforward as you do one glitch and then you get arbitrary code execution. Yeah, so this next part, you're seeing actual live memory at the top of the screen here. So what I'm going to have Soren do is talk through this going back and forth across the loading zone and explain what's happening. So what you're seeing at the there, bottom yeah, is... I mean, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, what you're seeing at the bottom is the normal view of, of Link in the lower left that you would ordinarily see. On the right, you're seeing an overhead view so you can see exactly what's happening from the top down. And then at the top is the heap, and it'll show you what objects are being loaded and unloaded in memory as this goes by. Uh, there there we go. goes. There's not much that I'll actually be able to say about what's happening specifically. You'll just you'll see like collects that rupee. The rupee gets unloaded from the heap. Um, when Link goes across the loading zone, you will see big changes as lots of things get loaded and unloaded. Um, and it's just the idea of we want to shuffle this around in a specific order. 
you know, the, each of these operations. And, and if you want to, if you are asking, well, how did anybody ever figure out the correct sequence of operations? There's actually scripts. Um, Mr. Cheese and Safe State together worked on this. Um, there are scripts that you can use to uh, come up with a set of actions. They will like check all possible, you know, combinations of actions and and things like that in order to align specific things. So basically, we need that uh, when we pick up the rock, and it is, you know, it hasn't even happened yet. This isn't. This is part of setting up locking the camera. Um, we want that when we pick up the rock, there's a pointer to somewhere into the rock's data, or that it's a pointer to the beginning of the rock's data, which is then referenced somewhere into it to adjust its position. We want that to line up in memory with where the wonder item gets loaded. Um, this is the rock, it's being highlighted there. Um, and we want, the, the whole point of the heat manipulation is that when the rock unloads and the wonder item loads back in, and I'll mention in a moment what the wonder item is, um, that those two addresses align correctly. Um, so the wonder item is basically invisible rupees. That's the short the short explanation. There's a bunch of places throughout Hyrule. You go somewhere, you do some jump or whatever, you get an invisible rupee. That's the code for that is is what we're overwriting. Yeah. So um, you'll see the uh, pointer from link uh, from the link uh, data to the rocks data. Um, and actually, we're not using the positions, we're using the rotation. Uh, the positions are floating point numbers, and those are harder to deal with with this. The rotation is two bytes. It's a short, a signed short S16 if you're a programmer. Um, and that we're going to be setting. So, you know, we, we set this up so that uh, we, we can overwrite half of one instruction in the wonder items code with a new rotation value. And then, of course, we have to set up an exact rotation value also, which will happen in a moment. So right now there's nothing loaded. Now the wonder item is loaded. The code is overwriting now every frame, overwriting the rotation of the of you know, what was the rotation of the rock. Now overwriting part of the code for the wonder item, and it's overwriting that instruction. Um, it'll pop up here on screen. Yeah, I'll get that. So it's a, it's a branch. Side. It's the target of a branch, and we can change. That means when the code gets to there. Um, it will go somewhere else depending on some condition. And so we're overwriting where it goes. So when the when it runs that code, it will then go somewhere else under our control. But that doesn't give us enough control to reach anywhere in memory. So we actually have to have that jump somewhere else that we can manipulate. So then we can go from there to jump somewhere else. Yeah, I'll take the next section. So yeah. we can jump forward or backward uh, 32,767 instructions. So uh, this this is kind of a little bit. We're going to get into some math here, but don't worry about it. Um, so we can re replace these with a, a lot of different uh, values, but it, we still only have thirty two thousand seven hundred sixty seven instructions forward or backward. So the farthest uh, back we can go, as soon as we get here in the video, okay, that means we can go as far back as eight zero one f seven three c four, and as far forward as eight zero two one seven three c four. But we actually need to get, I'm sorry, I said that address, that first address incorrectly. I apologize. We are at uh, uh, F73C4. We can go as far backward as D73C8 or as far forward as 2173C4. But where we want to go, where the instruction we want to jump to is at 8011D790. And there's a problem because that is beyond where we need to jump. It is outside of of the range uh, that we can get to, so instead we will have to do our jump in two stages. So let me see if we can get to the part of the video where we talk about that. Okay. So just to recap here, we use the uh, heat manipulation to get these two pieces of data to line up, which normally you wouldn't care about, but we care about. We lock the camera, use glitches to lock the camera. We use that to get the rock to despawn, and because of the heat manipulation, the wonder item to spawn instead. And that allows us to overwrite half of one instruction in the wonder item's code. Then when we, using gameplay actions, get the wonder item to be on screen, this code will run. It will run into that instruction, it will take our branch, and it will branch somewhere in memory under our control. And so the next step is change that to be somewhere, you know, we have to have a target that we can jump to. So that's the next piece here. Yeah, and this part's going to get kind of fun. So 
we need to do a branch instruction. Um, th there's some disadvantages of branch instructions, though. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there's several. Um, we have a very well. We have some. We have some limitations. Um, let me try to get caught up in my own notes here. Uh, so the main disadvantage of a branch instruction is that we only have 16 bits to work with, but a uh, a jump instruction dedicates 26 bits to the jump address, which is enough to get us to the controller data. So we need to locate another 32 bits in the heap that we can manipulate, and fortunately, we have that in the form of the actor data for Link himself, his own rotation data in particular. So yeah, so his own rotation the, and the rotation that he was last at when he was Z-targeting. Exactly, yeah. Now that gives us exactly what we need. Uh, so what we need to do is get Link's angle to be very, very precise. And the, the whole rest of the setup is going to be figuring out ways to do exactly that. How do you get his angle to be perfect? So I'm going to let uh, Soren talk about this part. Yeah, so again, it's a, uh, you know, made with a script, a series of... Uh, actions for Link to do that are repeatable by a human speedrunner that will each move Link's angle by an exact amount um, because we need those two angles to encode an exact value, which then becomes a jump instruction to the memory that has the controller data in it. Um, this is buffering a turn, which means um, we're doing a basically a frame-perfect trick by having the, the, the camera uh, by you know pausing and doing one frame at a time between the pauses. So now that Link's angle is correct, when we allow the camera to rotate, the wonder item will go on screen. Even though it's invisible, it still runs code because it's on screen. Um, that will run into the code that we modified. That will be a jump instruction. That will jump to Link's angle. Link's angles, the rotations encode uh, sorry, that was a branch instruction jump, jump going to Link's angle. Link's angles encode a jump instruction, which jump to the memory holding the controllers, and then it will the game will jump to the controllers and start executing. Well, at that moment, it'll execute whatever the controllers or whatever all the buttons are as code. And in order for the game to not crash, first of all, we have to. Well, I, let's. Let, I'll, I'll stop there because that's the next piece. Yeah, it is. It is pretty crazy. So, all right, at that point, save state steps away from the controller. They pass controller data over to, uh, or they pass the controller one over to Taskbot, and Taskbot starts sending a whole mess of data which you're seeing flying by on screen. It's, it's a lot of nutty stuff. So, what inputs is Taskbot actually sending? There's actually quite a lot, and the initial payloads take 1,136 frames of input to eject. Inject. It's a lot. So it starts with multiple layers about of about 15 seconds. Yeah, takes it yeah, it takes about 15 seconds. So bootstrapper 1 injects a program which injects a program which after now, it gets done injects a program which injects a program <laughs> which eventually Yeah, we'll, gets we'll us explain to more program. of what the, how this works. Um, <laughs> but yeah. We yeah. this is you can think of this as um, you know, two metaphors. Uh, one of them the one, you know, I thought of is we get a little crack in the fabric of reality. And so we hammer a wedge into that and make the crack wider and wider until we have full control over everything. The other metaphor somebody else came up with um, was you have a genie. The genie gives you one wish. What do you wish for? You wish for more wishes. And that is exactly <laughs> what we're doing here. Um, you know, like bootstrap or one. Here. Sorry? So I like the metaphors here. Those are, those are yeah. things you can relate to for sure. Yeah. So, you know, we, we will explain in more detail what these are doing, but basically, as soon as we can execute controller data as code, we have to make sure the game doesn't crash, but then we get a small foothold that we can start doing things. And what we start doing is writing programs into memory and executing them. And then those programs let us have progressively more and more control over the, over the game. Um, we're not erasing Ocarina of Time's engine and just running our own game from scratch. We're, you know, we'll, we'll explain what we're doing eventually uh, with all of this. But the, the, the goal of this whole process with these bootstrappers is to set up a way for us to be able to inject data into the console's memory at a reasonably fast rate. It ends up being about the rate of the, about the speed of a dial-up connection by a task bot ha mashing those buttons really fast. Um, and, you know, this, this set of bootstrappers is how we go from just that one instruction to 
you know, inject a dial-up connection through the controller ports. It's a lot. Okay, Kung Fu, or Fu, are there any questions that we should address now? I know that we just covered a whole lot. <laughs> this brings us to the point of, okay, save state played through, positioned a rock and positioned Link's angle and did some other various things to get to the point where we were able to trigger this initial foothold. The next part is going to be talking about the craziness that we did with Taskbot connected to all four controller ports. And then at a certain point, we're going to only be using ports two, three, four, two through four with Taskbot. Uh, but this is probably a good time to pause and say, hey, what, what questions came in from chat that we possibly glossed over or didn't see? <laughs> we do have somebody wondering if, if you need the expansion pack for this or no? Absolutely. Yes. So yes. we use the expansion pack heavily um, because we wanted to inject lots and lots of data for you know a crazy finale um, scene and and other things. Um, and so you know the N sixty four, if you're not familiar, it has four megabytes of RAM internally, and then it has a slot on the top where you can add you know, that, that you can see right there. You can add an expansion pack which adds an extra four megabytes. Some games use it. Ocarina of Time does not use it, so it's just four megabytes of memory sitting there available for us to do with whatever we want. And this is RAM, you know, that turns off, it goes, all the contents go away when you shut off the power. So this is mm. when, when once we do this, this setup, um, once we do the bootstrappers and we start loading data into the game, we're putting the data onto the expansion pack. So right. that's the answer is that yes, we used it extensively. However, the expansion pack is not it's, you know, it's crucial for us doing what we did with the game in terms of Triforce percent, in terms of the plot and everything. But the expansion pack is not what makes the exploits possible. Um, you could have done all of this up until the hyperspeed loader, and you could load a small amount of data into memory that's not the expansion pack and still fit it in some unused memory in various places. Um, mm -hmm. So you could still do something like this, but without the large amounts of custom content. Right, yeah, just like a smaller scale for sure. Yeah. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. Um, you have Ultimately, a few more what it gave that... us was just a lot faster presentation for GDQ. We theoretically could have done exactly the same thing, kind of, sort of, by <laughs> staging it in multiple sections and kind of using Taskbot as a very slow memory extension, but it wouldn't have been a very pleasant experience. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, we do have, a, uh, are there a finite number of input combinations to store code in, or does that even matter? Sorry, I think what they're probably asking is, uh, like, are there some things that you can't enter on the controller as buttons mm -hmm. that are instructions that you would need to execute? And the answer is yes. Um, well, that'll be on oh. the slide in a couple minutes. All right. Are you ready to dive mm -hmm. into what these bootstrappers do? Yes. Yeah, I am. <laughs> all right. So th this is going to be pretty wild. Uh, OK, so first of all, uh, we, we should talk about what inputs are actually happening here. Um, so there are just 24 bytes of memory dedicated to the controllers. We talked about it earlier, but there's two bytes of the buttons, two bytes for the analog stick, one error byte, one zero byte, and there are four of these sets. There's one for each controller. Now, a MIPS assembly instruction is always 32 bits long, or four bytes, and it's always aligned to a four-byte boundary. So if the controllers are treated as assembly instructions, here's how they'll end up being organized the first instruction consists of the first controller's buttons and analog stick bytes. The second instruction is the first controller's error code, a zero byte, and then the second controller buttons. Kind of confusing. Third instruction is the second controller analog bytes, its error code, and then a zero byte. The next three instructions are the same. They're just for controllers three and four. So if a controller is connected, connected which all four of them are right now, the error code is always going to be zero, meaning there's no error. This means that there are four instructions that will always be half zero, which is really not helpful to what we need to do. There's one other code in the game that zeroes out all of the input from controllers two and the four already, So, uh, since those were already in use for debugging features, something the developers did. So basically it's zeroed out before we can even read it. That only leaves us with two instructions we fully control, or rather almost fully control, because there are only 14 buttons on the Nintendo 64 controller, which means there are two bits in this data byte that will usually always be zero because there are no buttons mapped to them. So we opted to just not use these for the sake of making this run theoretically possible by a superhuman. Now, because these two bits... Though, to we zero, should... 
we should mention we did not cheat on those two bits. We didn't set them, um, yeah. but we did cheat with the stick in terms of we put in any x y value, even if it's an x y value that you can't physically push the stick to. Unless your controller is really worn or other things. Unless it's know. really worn or it's a third party <laughs> controller or something like that. So just yeah, to exactly. the, I have seen that question. We did not restrict ourselves on the stick ranges. Yeah, that would have been a little bit too limiting. But as it is, we did not use these two bits that will always be, always be zero. So after ex executing the controller code as data, or I'm sorry, the, the controller data as code, we still need a way to return back to the normal game function or we don't get our more wishes from the genie. We can't just let right. the program counter continue running past the end of the data, so we need to return back to that function, or from that function. So because of the two bits that are forced to be zero, we can't encode a return function, and we also need to restore the stack, but we can't, we can't do that in just one instruction. So we encode a jump to, this, uh, to some code, which restores the stack and returns. But that unfortunately means that we are limited to just a single instruction, just one. So as long as the wonder item is on screen, this code will run every single frame, and we can always change what buttons are being pressed on each frame. So we can execute whatever code we like as long as we do it at a frequency of only one instruction per frame and Ocarina of Time runs at 20 frames per second. So in order to account for lag frames, we also did one other thing. We sent everything twice because we talked about this earlier. We can't really predict where lag frames will happen. So ultimately, because we're duplicating input and we're doing all this crazy stuff, that means that we have one instruction um, uh, per two frames at 20 frames a second, or roughly about 10 instructions per second total. So the question, I guess, is, oops. The question is, what can you do with only one instruction? And the answer is not a whole lot. <laughs> Basically, our instructions are not even contiguous. Um, but there is a handy little global pointer register that we can take advantage of. It we got very lucky that... Yeah. The N64 ABI had a register that we can access that is never used by anything in the game. And so on one frame, we can set that value. And on the next frame, millions of instructions later, that value will still be there and we can write into memory. And so we encode alternating sequences on alternating frames of low to value, 16 bits, into this register, and then on the next frame, millions of instructions later, store that somewhere in memory. Yeah, it's it's nuts that we're able to even do that at all. <laughs> so if that if that register hadn't been there, this would have been a much much more difficult task. Probably could have figured out some way to jerry rig something, but this made it just okay. Well, then we can do this. Then we can write sort of arbitrary code into memory, and then we can execute that code, and then you can see how that can get us some more wishes. Yeah, it, we were very, very fortunate to have this. Okay, so Bootstrapper 1 very, very slowly writes Bootstrapper 2. So it's creating um, a lot of crazy stuff, and then the last thing it does is a jump in instruction that it encodes to jump to the beginning of the program that it just wrote, which is Bootstrapper 2, and it, from there on, it's running like normal code all at once in a single frame. So, all right, let's talk about what Bootstrapper, well, Bootstrapper 2 Bootstrapper 2 is. Bootstrapper 3 yeah, is yeah, back yeah. to how Bootstrapper 1 works. But Bootstrapper 2, the function of Bootstrapper 1 is that it, bit by bit, it writes in Bootstrapper 2 into memory and then runs Bootstrapper 2. Bootstrapper 2 runs all at once. It re-enables controller 2 and 4 input, which Nintendo had turned off. It just jumps to the controller data right away when it pulls the controllers, it just jumps to the controller data right there rather than using the wonder item. Um, and it actually fixes the wonder item that we corrupted before. It fixes that because we don't need two sources of arbitrary code execution. We only want one at a time. And then it actually sets up another address for uh, Bootstrapper 4, but we don't, don't worry about that. Bootstrapper 3 works the same way as Bootstrapper 1 on alternate frames. It is loading a value into the register and then storing it to a specific place in memory. Um, and I should mention, Bootstrapper 1, the memory that we were using for this is the font buffer. So when you have text on screen, the game loads the, the characters of the font 
from the cartridge into RAM. And so we're just using that memory because we know as long as there's no text box on screen, it's unused. And actually, if you pull up a text box during the process, you will see the code, well, you'll see little pixels of the code getting written into the characters, and then it'll crash because it'll execute the char- you know, the, the font as code, which we don't want. But anyway, I just wanted to mention that. And then Bootstrapper 3 is written somewhere else. So we're already up to Bootstrapper 4, so that went fast. Yes. Uh, yes. Bootstrapper 4 is active. When, when Bootstrapper 4 is active, the controllers are still being executed as code, but the first controller just jumps to the start of the Bootstrapper 4's code, and it leaves us with the other three controllers that can encode extra data. So before, we couldn't use these controllers because they were zeroed out and because they had to encode the extra jump instruction back to safety, but they're no longer zeroed out, and we can treat them as data. So it's going to read 64 bits of data, so that's 30 bits from the controllers 3 and 4, and 4 bits from controller too. It's not much. Uh, it ends up being kind of weird. Oh, and also there's a little note. These bits have to stay zero uh, so that we encode a no-op. The ones up in yellow in the upper right corner there have to stay zero. So we do have some weird limitations. But basically, this gets us to 64 bits a frame, 60 frames a second, and gets us up to one bytes, if, with one byte being eight bits, that gets us 480 bytes a second. But we're not done yet. We We want to go faster. So... We're going to introduce the hyperspeed loader. So we use Bootstrapper 4 to write the hyperspeed loader into memory. And then we jump to the beginning of the hyperspeed loader, and that sets everything else up. So the hyperspeed loader is the, the final payload of the bootstrappers, but it is the very beginning of Triforce Percent custom content. So you can continue with that, Dwango. Yeah, so it's going to basically do what you see here on screen. It's going to n- stop jumping to controller data. It's going to jump to the hyperspeed loader to read the controller data. It reads all 90 available bits from controllers 2 through 4. It pulls the controllers 8 times per frame. And that means And that at this point finally... is where we stop being able to do this in emulators because there's no yeah. emulator that can read your controller or read a task file at 8 times per frame, 480 frames per second. So everything after this point had to be tested entirely only on the on the real console. Yeah, exactly. So that means 90 bits uh, per pole, 8 poles per frame, 60 frames a second. That means we are at a rate of 5,400 bytes per second. This, this third part here is going to talk about these uh, the methods that we used to move with this data around. Now, we're grabbing data... With, with the hyperspeed loader. This yeah. is all about how the hyperspeed, the hyperspeed loader speed works. Loader. Yeah. Yeah. Now, we're grabbing 90 bits from the controller uh, eight times per frame, which results in 90 bytes of data from the, in the that forms a single packet. Each packet includes 85 bytes of payload data. There's a four-byte CRC, a cyclic, cyclic redundancy check, a CRC, and there's a one-byte command ID. And what the and by the way, loader, when you're saying there is all of this stuff, we made all of this up. Our team yeah. came up with this as the format that we needed, and so you know we wrote the hyperspeed loader code. We injected that as the you know the payload for Bootstrapper four, and then this is our system for having stable communication from the from the computer to the console. Yeah, exactly. So we then had to define a few methods of well, how are we going to handle this. So now we have a data to upload and then where to upload it to. So that's one packet type. The next packet type that we had was a, a packet type that was a function call. And this function call could also have some additional um, basically arguments to it, up to, up to four arguments. And then the if last you're a programmer, thing had, that will make sense. Yeah. And the last thing we had was, we'll, we'll get into the, the, this aspect later, but there, there were there were some other data aspects with, with chat messages, and we'll get into that later. Now, there's one other thing that we want to touch on before we get out of the technical explanation. So there's a bunch of error checking for the packets. So each packet has that 4-byte CRC. That allows the hyperspeed loader to detect if there happen to be any errors in the data. And if the game is in the middle of a loading zone or a loading screen, sometimes there might be packets that just got completely skipped. So we need to detect when there's an error. And we wanted to do that uh, in a way that was realistic. But how do you send data from the controller, uh, from, I'm sorry, from the console back to the controller? Because usually you're sending input to the console, not the other way around. Now, we thought about using the controller pack, and Soren pretty quickly decided that wasn't a, something that he wanted to do. He wanted to keep it 
authentic. So instead of well, using the Well, I would love to blame it on you, Duango, that I said that, you know, it's it's Taskbot rules that everything <laughs> has to be theoretically possible for a human. A human that could press buttons at an infinite speed, but still a human. A human cannot emulate a memory pack, but a human can feel a rumble pack vibrating. And we have three controllers, controllers two, three, and four, and we can put a virtual rumble pack into each of those virtual controllers, and we can have code from the console check the CRC, and if it's wrong, it'll rumble the controllers and in a particular pattern to indicate whether it was the, the packet came through correctly or not correctly. And theoretically, a superhuman who could press buttons 480 times per second could also feel whether the rumble is on or off 60 times per second and determine what data that, you know, that, 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 that meant that the data was right or wrong and then decide what data to send next. So that is exactly what Taskbot is doing. Okay, perfect. We did have a question, or it seems like there was a little bit of uh, confusion on when things went from the 20 FPS to the 60 FPS. Was that you all? Yeah, so uh, Bootstrapper 1, th by the way, first of all, this video is up on the Retro Game Mechanics Explained channel. You can look at it. It has perhaps better explanations than we're even giving now. But yes, <laughs> Bootstrapper 1 runs at 20 frames per second. Bootstrapper one injects Bootstrapper 2, one of the things that Bootstrapper 2 does is it changes things so that instead of using the wonder item to jump to controllers, every time the controllers are pulled at 60 frames per second, it, that just directly jumps to the controllers. So at that point, it's 60 frames per second, and we don't have to worry about lag frames anymore because that happens regardless of what's happening on screen. So then Bootstrapper 3 works the same way as Bootstrapper 1, but it is happening 60 frames per second. And then okay. Bootstrapper 4 happens also at 60 frames per second, and then we go up to 480 frames per second for hyperspeed loader. Right, 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 right. And that part I remember. Or bytes um, per second, cool. yeah. Okay, well, hopefully that was helpful. There have been people in chat who, I mean, people are loving this so far anyway. People are like, oh my gosh, I'm an engineer, this is so cool. Um, so all kinds of great reactions, and I can't wait to see it uh, more in process, right? Wow. Wow. That was incredible. That was incredible. Everyone in the room is standing. Standing for Mr. Tazba, Dwayne Gorosi, Soren, and Save State. So incredible. I want to read one last donation. I think this really hits it well. The Sound Defense donates $25. They say, this Ocarina of Time beta showcase may be the most fascinating thing I've ever seen at a GDQ. I can picture a game containing all of this interesting story content, and I want to see more. Thank you to Save State and the Tazbot team for showing this off. Give it up one more time. All right, everyone, we are having a great night. We're raising money for Doctors Without Borders. We will be right back after this. Don't you go anywhere.